What's up everybody and welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonas. This is episode 108 and today's a special pay-per-view review. We're going to be covering uh, AEW's Revolution pay-per-view. Uh, it was last night on the Fight Network or wherever you chose to uh, watch Revolution last night, but it was a hell of a show and I can't wait to get stuck in to talking about Revolution with uh, Chris Thornton. We, we have had Chris uh, on the show for a little while. I think the last time we spoke to Chris was back in October where we covered the, the debut episode of AEW Dynamite on the TNT Network. So Chris, Chris, good afternoon. Uh, like I say, like, like myself, you've probably only had a few hours sleep because uh, uh, it's a crazy Brits. We had to watch it in the, in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, but uh, great to have you back on the show. How are you, sir? Hi, John. I'm really good. Thank you. Apart from the aforementioned tiredness, as you say, uh, you. we are gluttons for punishment, uh, but we do love a wrestling in the wee hours of the morning. So I'm a little bit on the tired side, a little bit on the cranky side, maybe, but more than happy with the show I saw. So, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah. And why is it as Brits, the only kind of pay-per-view we've had recently that's been at a reasonable hour has been the Saudi show from Thursday? Why couldn't it have been something decent? But but never mind. <laughs> Like you said, we are gluttons for punishment, and we, we, you know, if it's if it's worth staying up for, we'll definitely stay up and watch it. And and AEW Revolution was definitely one of them shows, definitely worth staying up for. And and to be honest with you, any, anything AEW related is definitely worth staying up for. I'm, I'm de- I've definitely become uh, much more of a convert over the months. I know that when we started doing these podcasts and when we started reviewing AEW shows, I think the first one we covered was Double or Nothing back last May, and there was me, you, and Ash at the time. I was very skeptical, and I thought that a lot of their matches. Uh, in particular, you know, their, their tag matches are very um, spot fests and uh, I wasn't really getting into it. And I was very skeptical, especially being a diehard WWE and NXT fan. But I've got to say, um, every Wednesday or Thursday over here in the UK, Dynamite is always the first show I watch ahead of NXT. And uh, I, I love covering their shows now. Been a massive convert, especially you know, with the characters they've been able to build and the stars they've been able to develop in such a short space of time. And uh, one act that we're going to talk about fairly soon that I was very critical of uh, was the Young Bucks. I really kind of turned around to, to them as well. But uh, um, you, do you still kind of watch Dynamite most weeks or every week, Chris? What's kind of your, your viewing pattern on a weekly basis nowadays? Yeah, I do try and catch it every week. Um, most of the time it's on the UK. Unfortunately, you know, it is. Um, social media has tended to spoil things. So unless you can stay away for the first couple of days, um, inevitably you will see the results. But yeah, I do try and watch it uh, in its entirety most weeks. Um, I think, you know, the product has got better and better. I think, more importantly, their pay-per-views have got more consistent in terms of both production quality uh, and in terms of the actual content. Uh, But yeah, Dynamite does consistently produce. We've still got a few critiques here and there, uh, but we're not here to talk about Dynamite. But yeah, still big fan, huge convert, and I'm really glad to see it kind of uh, ramping up a little now. The interest is definitely getting a little bit widespread now. Uh, Nowhere near the level, uh, of course, I'd like it to be as a fan, uh, but we're definitely seeing that interest now. Mm, definitely and uh, can't wait to talk about uh, all the great action from last night and I've got, I've got a couple of nitpicky niggles as well uh, yeah. but uh, it literally nitpicky niggles but uh, first of all I just want to throw out a couple of plugs uh, you know have you visited our wrestlingwithjohners.com webpage yet so it's, it's been uh, cleverly developed by uh, uh, one of our followers um, but it covers all the latest pro wrestling news exclusive articles as well as our full archive of podcast episodes all of our social media links are on there as well exclusive podca- uh, podcast podcast interviews and video interviews like the one we did with Chantel Jordan uh, quite recently. You've got all the Wrestling With Jonas merchandise up there as well and so much more. So go and check that out. That's WrestlingWithJonas.com and while you're there, uh, there's, a, there's a PayPal donate link or a PayPal donate button at the very top of the page. So if you fancy supporting your favourite podcast, Wrestling With Jonas, any amount of donation would go a long way to helping us produce the quality podcast and YouTube content that you've been used to since 2018. Simply click on the page PayPal button at the top of the wrestlingwithjohners.com website to help support um, all the hard work that goes into producing uh, this podcast. I, I like to consider it as one of the most consistent and most prolific wrestling podcasts around with up to two brand new podcast episodes dropping every single week and multiple YouTube videos released on a weekly basis on our YouTube channel. Uh, please support the Wrestling With Jonas podcast with a small donation using the PayPal button at the top of the wrestlingwithjohners.com page. And of course, if you enjoy listening to, to this podcast, simply subscribe. Please go out and subscribe whatever platform you're listening to us on so that you can be notified every time a new episode drops. So Chris, as the plugs out of the way, I've got to do it, man, because you've got, you know, you've got to try and pay these bills. 
Uh, but uh, great to have you back on on the Wrestling with Jonathan podcast. Um, last night's uh, AEW Revolution was uh, in front of a sell- sold out crowd at the Wind Trust Arena in Chicago, Illinois. So it all started with there was a 30 minute uh, pre show. Uh, there was a buy in match as well. Now previous AEW pay per views have had like a buy in uh, battle royal. I've done that a few times. They've always been good fun. But we went straight into uh, to a match. It was a, a previously advertised match. Um, a lot of people were kind of expecting this one to possibly drop into the buy-in or the pre-show as it did. And it was SCU versus the Dark Order. So prior to this match, uh, there, there was a, a backstage interview with all members of SCU along with Tony Schiavone, uh, with, with Scorpio Sky telling Christopher Daniels that it might be best if Daniels sits this one out in the back with Sky and Kazarian appearing to show uh, some, some concerns over the recent rumours that Daniels possibly could be recruited by the Dark Order with everyone wondering who the exact exalted one might be uh, Daniels reluctantly agrees and Sky and Kazarian come out for their buy-in match so there's some shenanigans on the outside where Kazarian gets thrown into the ring steps at the beginning of this match uh, other members of the Dark Order get involved um, but it's Evil Ono who nails Scorpio Sky with a, a clubbing blow to the back of Sky's head off of a, an O'Connell roll uh, with Stu Grayson getting the pin for victory um, there, there is a, a bit of a beat down by the Dark Order on Scorpio Sky and Kazarian uh, that can continues until Chicago's very own native son, uh, Colt Boom Boom Cabana. He comes out to help the good guys, only to be beat down himself. Then we get some strange music. There's an appearance from a cloaked individual uh, with everyone presuming that this was the exalted one. However, it was Christopher Daniels underneath the robe leading us uh, to believe that Daniels is, is in, was indeed the exalted one, as uh, a lot of the rumours have been uh, floating around. Um, that was until Daniels raced down to the ring, dived over to, to the top rope, uh, helped SCU clean house, uh, proving that at least for now um, he's SCU through and through. So this is it's kind of quite an action-packed uh, pre-show or buy-in match. Uh, a lot to unpick here obviously there's the kind of the the background storyline of who is the exalted one and what role christopher daniels has to play uh, in scu or the dark order uh, but a fun little uh, kickoff match chris uh, give us your thoughts on this one buddy yeah it was a good match um maybe like other people i was expecting it maybe on the main card only because the exalted one dark order storyline has taken up a lot of the dynamite television time actually and you know it's also been kind of uh, hinted out on being the elite as well and and that's played very well into the dynamic of the current scu uh where, yeah daniel has been given a bit of a cold shoulder and i genuinely feel sympathy for christopher daniels uh in that role i think he plays it very well and uh, as you know big scu fan of scu so mm-hmm. always want to uh, see these guys and that's you know more than once they've either been the opening of the show or been involved in the pre-show and i think again they're solid hands they are perfect for that kind of thing they amp up the crowd um but yeah good match solid match um Colt Commander, what what a fan so yeah really happy to see boom boom Colt great little there. cameo there loved oh, it when he came out definitely of course <laughs> yeah, of course and in chicago of course you know he had to be there so uh yeah really pleased to see that um you know, Give us your thoughts on the exalted one, then, uh, there, yeah. buddy. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of rumours going around that it, it could be a former WWE wrestler. I mean, obviously, you've got uh, Matt Hardy's contract ended last night, um, so you know, there's big, big question marks as to whether he's extended his contract or signed a new contract with WWE, um, or whether he could be going to another company. Um, you've got uh, the former Luke Harper, uh, Brody Lee. He's now a free agent, and I think his 90-day no-compete clause will probably be ending fairly soon so he could be in the mix as well Mm -hmm. uh it could be christopher daniels it could be uh but uh, what's your thoughts on this angle i mean they've they've certainly played it out very very well i wasn't a big supporter of the dark order or or of the angle to start off with but they've kind of drawn me in they've they've played out the angle uh not that they haven't kind of you know blown the load too soon they're kind of drawing it out you know but giving us a good storyline every single week um but they are kind of making us think who is the exalted one will it be a big ex wwe star or somebody from uh, the current aw roster but to any thoughts on that one yeah i'm i'm not you know always a fan of this kind of storyline um uh, but yeah if it goes on for too long but they've done it quite well so far so we'll just see how long they take to pull the trigger it reminds yeah. me of when you had the leader of aces and eights if you remember that in tna yes um, of course, the higher power that it turned to be Vincent Kennedy McMahon himself. You know, it's very reminiscent. But there were rumours that that was going to be Christopher Daniels as well back uh, 20 odd years ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can imagine. Absolutely. That, yeah, yeah that, that, that was the kind of original plan when they signed him back in 98, that he was going to be the higher power, which mm. eventually turned out to be Vince McMahon. So, I, I, you know, it was kind of uh, a little bit reminiscent of what they could have done back in WWF many years ago. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, carry on. Yeah, it could have been uh, Raven, who's also been spotted, apparently, in the crowd yeah. uh, recently. Um, and indeed, yeah, it, it l- looks, for all intents and purposes, like Matt Hardy. Um, I don't know, personally, you know, I'm happy to see Matt over in AEW. Um, but I have this sneaky feeling he's going to re-sign with WWE to make some kind of WrestleMania appearance, probably to do with um, Edge and Randy Orton match that's going on, um, because they would tie in nicely with this X bit arrival. Maybe he's now gone to save Edge. I'm not sure. I'm just spitballing, really. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a common common thread that's going out there, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know who it actually is. Yeah, I mean it's it's good to have a consistent storyline, and you know sometimes it, it's great to have like I'm chasing for the title, or you know you took my girl. But yeah, some kind of ongoing mystery is always good in wrestling, and it does keep viewers hooked in. Uh, personally, I don't think they necessarily needed a higher power. I think Evil Uno, uh, oh no, sorry, was doing a good job. You know, he's a guy yeah. in a suit wearing a mask. He was quite charismatic. Uh, I actually think you know he was already quite decent uh, in that position. Um, yeah, I don't know what agree. it really for him um but yeah i think it's just good to have something that yeah keeps fans guessing keeps a rumor mill churning and then any new signing that comes in you know there's the potential for them there luke harper would be my first personal kind of choice you know who i'd like to see in there but i think the more obvious choice is uh, it's mr hardy Mm, yeah it'll be interesting and um i certainly if it is going to be hardy I don't think they're going to kind of leave us waiting too long because, like I said, his contract expired um, last night. And I don't think there's any 30 day or 60 day or 90 day uh, no compete clauses from what I understand. So uh, if he hasn't signed with WWE or re-signed, then he's a free agent from today. So that would be very interesting. But moving on to the main card then. So a lot of people were surprised that this match went on first. But we did have um, two big veterans of the, the, the wrestling game. Dustin Reynolds versus Jake Hager, or as uh, Jim Ross slipped up once or twice and said, uh, Jack Swagger. Um, but uh, never mind. I think one of those was on the pre-show, so it probably didn't matter too much. But, uh, um, you know, of course, was, this was the first actual match that we've seen from Hager since he joined uh, AEW and the Inner Circle when Dynamite first came to air back last October. I can't remember whether it's the first, second or third episode, but it, it was fairly yeah. early on to their run. Uh, Hager came down to the ring. Uh, before he got in the ring, he kind of uh, met up with his wife, who was uh, um, kind of in the first row at ringside, and uh, kissed his wife, um, who was uh, kind of watching close up. Hager then dominated the early stages with Dustin making a bit of a comeback uh, and is stopping by uh, Jake Hager's wife, um, uh, preventing her from slapping Rose before planting a big kiss on her lips. Um, and uh, that, that was quite fun. There, there was a, a, This was a fun, quite a hard-hitting opener. They are quite physical with one another with Rhodes getting a close near fall from a Canadian destroyer before attempting a, a cross-arm breaker on Hager. Hager manages to transition into an ankle lock. Uh, the end of the match comes with uh, Hager hitting a bit of a low blow which is a move that he's been renowned for not just uh, in pro wrestling mm. but on his MMA matches as well so hitting a low blow before clamping in like a, a triangle choke um, with the, the referee quickly calling for the bell with uh, Dustin seemingly being unresponsive uh, to bring an end to this uh, quite solid opener so uh, I thought he was good um, you know uh, some might consider it a surprising pick to go on first you normally expect a, a bit of a high energy high octane match to kick things off for the live crowd but I think that uh, these two guys delivered probably because a lot of the fans are quite familiar with who they had in the ring um and it was a uh, quite interesting to see uh, jake hager in his first uh, pro wrestling match for aw probably his first pro wrestling match for quite a while um and uh, you know the, the two had some chemistry they worked quite well and i'm glad that uh, jake hager won he brought home the victory uh, any any thoughts on what went down in this opener for you then chris yeah, I actually thought it was quite a strong opener, to be fair. Mm. Um, maybe a little surprised to see it on, but it's good to see Hager fight at last. Um, yes. And he, you know, he looked really good. And I think a lot of people will tell you back in his kind of uh, WWE days, he didn't really ever have a problem with the moveset that he had or his, you know, his look per se. Obviously, it was the more on the mic stuff, you know, in, in general, he wasn't presented particularly well. And I think that was more kind of the fault of the writers more than anything. But yeah. this was obviously his chance at redemption. And he, you know, I think he took it really well. He looked very strong, you know, and obviously he's been practicing behind the scenes a lot more, but he certainly didn't look like someone who hadn't had a real competitive match in that long because he really just, you know, went straight back into it. 
And it was it was quite nostalgic seeing him do the kind of swagger bomb, although it was referred to as the Vader bomb by Ross, which yeah. is accurate, but you know, yeah. um, and I couldn't call it swagger bomb, I suppose. Um, but yeah, he you know he bust out the gut wrench power bomb um, and the kind of high angle. I think it's almost like a power slam, but it's really high angle. It takes him over. It's very kind of MMA style move, um, and of course the ankle lock. So yeah, all of the old move sets were there, but with some new ones and. Uh, he does look legit, you know, and that's because he is, you know, he's had the Bellator background and he looks strong. I think my only kind of two criticisms is is one kind of how normally he's very silent and stoic and barely says a word. And but in this match, he was quite kind of heelish. And because of the interactions with his wife, it kind of humanized him in a way uh, more like heel way, you know, than they have before. So maybe I would have stayed away from that and kept him as just a kind of silent destroyer. Uh, but having his wife in there is a side that they've not really shown to him so far. The other small, small criticism is that when he was um, when he whipped on the ankle lock onto Dustin, he didn't really sell it. Um, you know, angle yeah. kind of reminiscent of kind of angle. He used to read really like wrench on it, and the longer it goes on, the more I want to see Jake kind of you know be determined to finish using that. But yeah. did finish with a submission, uh, which which looked you know decent enough. And yeah, I thought he looked good. Uh, Dustin, again, it's, it's difficult to believe uh, that he's 50. Yeah, <laughs> just incredible. Yeah. Well, know, it's but... difficult to get out of bed most mornings. I'm only 43, so uh, when I'm 50, <laughs> I, I hope to be half as agile as he is. But uh, oh, there we go. Good. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, I mean, I thought maybe he would have come back for that one match, you know, with Cody and then the tag match. And maybe that would have been it. But he's still there. He's still there week in, week out. Yeah. And he's still in the business. And you can't criticize that. You know, we all know what happened uh, with uh, Goldberg. You know, Dan, there's a lot of criticism about that and his performance. And the polar opposite of that is is Dustin, you know, to show he's consistently there. Um, and consistently getting over still. So, yeah, well done him, really. But well done both of them. I generally thought it was an interesting, tough back-and-forth fight. And, um, yeah, no complaints with the finish or the quality of the match. Yeah, interestingly, you brought up the the, the point about uh, uh, AW almost humanising Jake uh, mm. Jake Hager um, last night. I was going to bring up the same point that so uh, you normally get this silent assassin, this stoic, yeah. uh, rather menacing character, the, the kind of the straight man to Jericho's funny man, you could say. Um, and although Jake Hager in his straight role has been quite comedic uh, mm. at, at points, to be honest with you. Um, but um, the, the fact they did almost humanise him and had him kind of passionately kiss his wife before the match and involve his wife and uh, kind of made me think, you know, why did they do that? There has been some rumblings online that uh, somewhere in the future there's going to be a split between Hager and the Inner Circle mm-hmm. and a potential feud between Hager and uh, Chris Jericho. So potentially to kind of add that extra di- dimension or uh, yeah. element to Hager's character could be a little bit of a, a, a seed planted for that eventual split and possible feud. And I'm just spitballing based on kind of rumours that I've heard and putting two and two together and coming up with five. Mm. But, um, you know, it does, does make you wonder why they did that because um, there was no real reason or explanation ahead of the match. But it, it, it still all worked and it was a good match. And, yeah. um, you know, I would personally... I know they had to have this match as a bit of a blow off because of the attack um, ahead of Cody versus Jericho back last year mm. when um, uh, Hager supposedly in storyline mode broke Dustin's uh, arm or wrist or whatever it was. Um, but I, I would have liked to have seen somebody else in the ring other than uh, other than Dustin, to be honest with you. I would have loved to have seen because we've seen some face to face between Hager and Luchasaurus. And that would have been a, a better match for me. But uh, that, that's the, uh, and I probably should really speak about this at the end of our review, but Lutasaurus or maybe the, the Jurassic Express was the only kind of missing element from this show. And I know they were shown briefly on the front row, but uh, that that's possibly a match we might get in the future and definitely one that I'll definitely be up for seeing. But uh, moving on, uh, we then get an announcement, a bit of a video package that AEW are bringing back its own version of War Games mm. um, to AEW on March the 25th or 26th, yeah. uh, a few weeks. Wednesday's time uh, in the video package they, they called it Blood and Guts uh, which will probably be the name of that week's episode because I do like to theme their episodes occasionally uh, with the cage presumably being called uh, the match beyond is, is the rumour that I've heard I think Cody has been uh, setting out some uh, some trademarks for the match beyond um, as, as a phrase so that could be going because uh, WWE obviously hold the rights and the trademark to the War Games name uh, but this will be a, another truly remarkable episode of AEW Dynamite when they have this match in just three weeks' time. So 
I, I was kind of just thinking uh, in my head uh, who might be involved in this war game style match, the match beyond or uh, blood and guts. Uh, I'm guessing that as a faction, you've probably got enough people within the inner circle to be part of this match. Uh, any, any kind of thoughts or uh, any kind of inklings as to who might be in this uh, match that's taking place in a few weeks time, Chris? Yeah, I, I think, um, and it's interesting to talk about trademarks because I was reading about how Cody, you know, is trying so hard to get all of the kind of his, his dad's trademarks you know, yeah. back again. He's doing a good job, you know, so far. He's managed to wrestle away quite a few of them, no pun intended. Indeed. But, you know, War Games is, you. Can, I suppose you can't gimmick the type of match. You can only gimmick the name. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I look forward to Blood and Guts. Um, interesting title. Um, but, yeah, uh, it should be a good match. But who's going to be in it? So, I think in a circle, definitely. Uh, against who? So the obvious kind of one of them would be, I suppose, Moxley uh, as an obvious rival now, um, which also leaves probably Allen in there. Um, and then the other two is going to, it's interesting with the kind of tag, like who you'd put up against Santana and Ortiz. Uh, yeah. I don't know who the natural like rivalry is there anymore. Um, but, and yeah. they seem to have taken a bit of a backseat. But yeah, I can definitely see it being an inner circle led one. The elite are too busy kind of infighting, I suppose. You know, Cody's always busy doing whatever. So I think it cancels up that kind of faction. Um, so yeah, inner circle versus question marks, I suppose it's for now. It's going to be it's going to be interesting, and uh, that's another reason to tune in every Wednesday, I suppose, to see who's going to yeah. be pulled into that match. But uh, the next match um, uh, was a lot of people's match of the night, and I know we spoke about this briefly off air. But uh, Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara, I think it was only announced uh, last week or the week before that these two were officially part of the Revolution card. Um, obviously, they they've had a little bit of a rivalry going for the last few weeks. Um, I think especially after Sammy Guevara did some damage to Darby Allen's voice box or throat uh, with, with uh, the use of uh, Darby's very own skateboard. But um, g- going into this match, I mean, my, my thoughts were, you know, wow, you know, two really, really talented, very young up and coming stars that have really been kind of utilised very, very well by AEW. Um, and uh, whereas WWE are constantly criticised for not pushing their young stars as well as they could, if at all, sometimes uh, these two, have definitely been utilised very, very well. And, uh, the, 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 you know, obviously Sammy Guevara being part of the inner circle, Darby Allen being a bit of a, a, bit, of, being a bit of a lone wolf, you could say. Um, but uh, going into the match, I mean, this match started at a pace with the fight starting on the outside of the ring. There, there was, was a bit of a scary spot, Chris, and you probably noticed this, where Guevara was draped over the guard railing on the outside, setting up Allen for a, a tope through the ropes. But Darby Allen, he came up short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he's, he's, his foot caught on the rope yeah. just at the very last fraction of a second as he was going through, causing Darby Allen to land on his face first on the floor, fairly clear of his opponent. This was acknowledged on commentary as well. Very reminiscent of Le Parker too, and mm. the way that he kind of, um, you know, suffered that injury, which led to his un- unfortunate death um, back in November last year. But uh, the match continued. Fortunately, Guevara sets up Dar- Darby Allen onto a table on the outside with Sammy delivering a, a superb uh, six thirty cent on from the top. Uh, of course, sending Derby crashing through the table and the match uh, had not even officially got started at this point. I think that uh, <laughs> they hadn't even got in the ring uh, before uh, this table spot. Then the bell did ring. There was a huge Spanish fly from Sammy Guevara for a close near fall. Uh, the match comes to an awesome end with uh, Derby dropping Guevara um, across the exposed, there was an exposed turnbuckle throat first uh, before delivering his trademark coffin drop for a very hard fought and thrilling pinfall victory in this amazing action packed, uh, dare I say it, a five minute match. Now they put in more blooming spots and action um, that, that could have filled out a 10 or a 15 minute match, but uh, it, it didn't all seem kind of crammed in. It, it worked really well. I thought the match was perfectly executed and Darby Allen travelled almost two thirds of the way across the <laughs> ring to nail that coffin drop. It was a tremendous ending to a tremendous match between these two outstanding talents and I know I've said this before but it's incredible to think how far these two have come both as wrestlers and as personalities as characters under the AEW banner and Darby Allen is fast becoming one of the, the biggest and hottest baby faces in the company certainly judging by the reaction of the Chicago crowd on Saturday night which is a massive testament to how AEW uh-huh. has developed its newest stars in such a short period of time uh, but uh, I, I know you are a big fan of this match and these two individuals but uh, give us your thoughts on what went down last night then buddy yeah five minutes five stars in my mind yeah. it was um, <laughs> just intense I, I put my notes like video game like almost like they were spamming their special moves because it didn't feel like just as, like a spot fest like you said like oh, it, it didn't. actually 
played into Alan's kind of strength. That's how he is. He's intense. Uh, as his neck tattoo says, he's relentless. You know, he, he doesn't waste any motion in between. So actually, one, it suited that. And two, it played into the kind of grudge match aspect. I don't like, and we've seen, I hate to keep mentioning it, we've seen a lot of this with um, uh, Rusev uh, and um, Lashley when they were supposed to be like sworn enemies, but it was still a casual, you know, rest hold sometimes. Yeah. And that's not what you want to see in a grudge match. You want to see determined and, you know, just fast paced, turning each other's face off. And this is what these guys did. It almost like they were trying to outdo each other. And I wouldn't be surprised if there is a genuine kind of like respect and rivalry between those two. They're two young stars. Darby Allen, they, oh, I, I'm pretty sure they know what they've got with him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, he is genuinely like a superstar. He's so different in so many ways. Everything about him is different and refreshing. But everything looks effective as well. Um, yeah, he nearly killed himself, but that would have taken a lot more, I think, than that to put him down and to stop him because yeah. nothing seems to hurt him. You know, he's done coffin drops onto the... It's like, pretty indestructible, yeah. Yeah. It really is. I'm a big fan of Sammy G as well, because I just think he's got real charisma, you know. So, yeah, when I'd seen that matchup, I was actually like, you know, that that for me was was going to be great. Um, of course, it would have been good to go on a little longer, but I don't feel like it was too short either. Um, Spanish Fly, you mentioned the 630 splash, which was just insane. I mean, it, take your pick, you know, from the highlights. But for me, yeah, match of the night, it genuinely got me excited and um, I was so pleased and I didn't really feel like either one of those people came off looking bad. So, yeah, tremendous match. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I could see them two go at it time and time again. I, I wouldn't yeah. get bored for one moment. But uh, I'm really, really excited to see where these two are in, you know, a few months time, six months time. Mm -hmm. uh, this time in 12 months time. Um, I'm not saying for one minute that either one of them are going to be world champions. But uh, potentially if there was a secondary title, then, yeah, put them in that spot. But, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, they're just going from strength to strength to strength. But I uh, love that match. And like I say, mm -hmm. um, it, it wasn't a rushed five minutes as well. You know, it's perfectly executed. Executed. and uh, the re if it, if it was just a spot fest five minute match with the same moves and and uh, action that went down last night then I would have thought oh, you know maybe not quite as good as it is it turned out to be but they had that story they had that rivalry mm -hmm. they they had that chemistry and they sold for one another and it, it was a you know pretty much dare I say a perfect wrestling match in terms of action and storytelling and I loved the hell out of it so uh, yeah definitely go and go and check that one out if you haven't done so already. Yeah, um, but uh, go on. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I was going to say you think that would have been the opener actually to hook people in. Yeah, it had that feel. That's what I was it? expecting. It very, mm. Yeah, it very much had an opening match feel, but it's just tremendous. And I just wanted to note real quick, like Darby's little kind of bespoke entrance videos that he makes, you know, for his opponents, which I really yeah. like. Um, first of all, doing a backflip onto a skateboard and landing it is, is amazing. But yeah, I always <laughs> like he. But there's a little bit of kind of homemade DIY which fits into that kind of punk element of his with his little entrance videos. So yeah, just a nice little touch, I think, uh, and something different. Yeah, and as indestructible as he is, Chris, mm. every time he does the coffin drop, <laughs> I do kind of almost have to look through my through my fingers, to be honest with you, because it's one of their moves that you just don't want to go wrong. Uh, but I'm sure it, it, it will go wrong one day. But, you know, mm. I'm sure he'll stand up and kind of take it and survive. But uh, uh, yes, because did he hit a, or attempt a coffin drop um, when he was fighting Cody in one of the shows last year and landed on the the, the hardest part of the ring, the ring yep. apron. Um, and that must have hurt like hell. But oh uh, yes, yes, indeed. But uh, yeah, a, a really good match. Uh, now, the next match we're going to talk about coming out of the show last night was my match of the night. Uh, once again, full of action um, and uh, full of storyline development full of characters um and it was of course the world tag team title match uh, between current champions hangman adam page kenny omega going into it against the challengers the young box uh so so just to cover off some of the highlights from this one you know the fans were really into uh really into this one and really into adam page mm. i think uh if we if we were talking about adam page from say six months ago you know i think we'd admire adam page as a, as a wrestler and what he can do in the ring uh, but uh, I think he was fairly bland as a character. Uh, but uh, now there's this added kind of element to Adam Page and whether you like the angle or don't like the angle, the, the, the drinking angle is what I'm referring to. And it's kind of added that extra kind of edge to his character. And he's also become super over with the fans uh, because of how he's been playing this character over the last few weeks. So, I mean, the fans were really into Adam Page. Uh, and in fact, they were really into this match full stop last night. Um, I, I, I was really impressed with the, the Young Bucks as 
as well, uh, proving why they're widely regarded as one of the best tag teams in the world. All four guys told a great story in this match with the Bucks seemingly playing the role of the heels, although they're typically baby faces. And of course, you had the, the, the fractious relationship between Page and Omega as well. Uh, Nick Jackson was on fire on this one, um, as was Adam Page, as I mentioned. However, uh, you know, Page even nailed a, a moonsault uh, onto both Bucks from the top turnbuckle to the outside. That was pretty impressive. There was a, a This Is Awesome chant from the fans uh, with, with Page nearly getting the match won with a, a blockbuster suplex. That was quite impressive. Uh, Omega gets spiked on his head from an avalanche poison rana from the top turnbuckle. Uh, then there was a, a trifecta of Northern Light suplexes on the outside on uh, Adam Page. Uh, before the Bucks delivered an indie driver on the right, a rampway, seemingly putting Page out of action, um, you know, certainly at that point anyway. Uh, the Bucks then take turns in super kicking, kicking Kenny Omega's head before Page makes a recovery to powerbomb Nick Jackson through a table at ringside. Uh, Page and Omega deliver a V-trigger and a Buckshot Lariat combo, but where that typically wins their matches, they only got a two count on this occasion. Then there's a pair of Buckshot Lariats uh, from Hangman, uh, one to Nick Jackson on the rampway, uh, one more to Matt Jackson back in inside the ring with Paige hooking the leg getting the pinfall in this really, really good match. We're in 31 minutes. Uh, so uh, conversely to the five-minute uh, spectacle that we just spoke about, this one went 31 minutes and uh, managing to retain the AEW Tag Team Championships were Omega and Adam Page. Um, after the match, Page teased one more buckshot lariat uh, for his own partner, Kenny Omega, uh, but that's all it was for now, just a tease. And uh, Chris, I've got down here on my notes, uh, wow, what a match. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you'll agree, probably the best match I've seen from the Young Bucks in a long, long time and a tremendous outing from Kenny Omega and uh, Adam Page. And, and before I kind of get your opinions on it, I just want to say it's been a tremendous week for Kenny Omega. And I think he's put in two of his best uh, performances, two of his best outings in the last... Uh, four or five days. Certainly that 30-minute Ironman match against Pac was tremendous. And uh, this tag team uh, championship match on Saturday night at Revolution. So, you know, Kenny Omega, um, where a lot of people are talking about Adam Page, Kenny Omega certainly shone in this match as well. But uh, give us your thoughts on this tremendous tag team championship match then, Chris. Yeah, possibly, possibly the other match of the night, uh, yeah. along with the previous one, I think. And um hate to say that the show had peaked by this point, you know, but possibly it had. And um, tremendous. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it there. I was slightly surprised to see the Bucks booed as much as they were, because leading up to it, you've got to think that the fans are getting behind a character who's now kind of ditched his friends for whatever reason, you know, yeah. turned into an alcoholic, um, being quite bitter in so many ways. So it's interesting that the fans are getting behind it and whether or not that was the intention. I'm not sure. They've always liked Hangman, but yeah, his popularity is definitely an all-time high at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the Bucks did end up, obviously, playing into the heel part of it, but there was that great moment where uh, Matt had started going after Kenny's injured shoulder, and Nick had kind of calmed it down. Matt had realised what he was doing, you know, so they, they kept the conflict there, and it's a storyline that's been built through being the elite again, like, really well, and it's been probably the best thing about that show. Um, genuinely, I don't know where it's really going to kind of go in. It was reminiscent of when um, Omega and Ibushi, Koto Ibushi, fought the Young Bucks, um, I think over a year ago now, well over a year ago. Um, that was very similar, kind of, you know, Civil War and friends having to go at it, but it didn't make it any less of a, a great match. So, yeah, tremendous effort from everyone all around. Nick Jackson is by far the best hot tag in the business. He comes back, you know, with the poetry in motion and then the kicks here and the bulldogs here and the flips there, and he's incredible. You know, he, he never ceases to amaze me with that kind of hot tag comeback of his uh, matt now as i've said before they've distinguished themselves matt brings the kind of power and strength nick brings the agility and, and the kicks uh yeah tremendous work by the young bucks so i want to give them some credit um surprising they've yet to reach you know the the peak and reach these tag titles uh yeah. but i think it was the right decision to keep it on basically a really hot act you know in, in hangman page and omega doing a tremendous job of sitting back you know still putting in these tremendous performances you mentioned he had the iron man match as well uh, but yeah he's doing a good job of not taking too much of the limelight there um there was some spots i wanted to mention um there was a 450 splash um from nick onto adam page after he'd locked in the chicken wing which was quite good you know matt kind of looked up saw his partner was there well telegraphed you know hit that nice counter 
And then I've also got the locomotion suplexes um, that Matt did onto Adam Page on the outside, on the ramp. Um, and again, it's the storyline selling. So not only was it a great move, great execution, but Matt had like doubt in his face on the third suplex. You know, he, he looked, he did mm. genuinely look concerned. He hit it anyway, of course. And then they went after him. Um, but yeah, I, I love that move. And um, false finishes and an unfinished business is the other note I've got. You know, it doesn't quite feel over this and the way they mm, tease the betrayal. Very true. Yeah, very good. You know, so really good uh, all around. Everyone there a star. They gave it their absolute all. And I think I was impressed. Um, I mean, I love like when it comes to pay per views, my favorite thing is always not knowing when a match is going to finish. And this had plenty of that. Um, so, yeah, really, really good. It had the storyline elements built into it. It had the emotion there, physicality, spectacular moves. It really had it all. And I say that about every Young Bucks, uh, Young Bucks match, to be fair. I, you know, a big fan myself. And I haven't always followed them all my life. So I'm a, quite a recent convert, really, uh, I guess, from kind of New Japan onwards. But yeah, they, they really are probably the best tag team in the business, despite not having the belts at the moment. Yeah, and like you say, there's some unfinished business there. Yeah. You know, obviously we had the tease of the, uh, you know, possibly the additional buckshot lariat yeah. from Page when uh, Omega was looking groggy after the match inside the ring. Um, you know, obviously we, a, a lot of us were expecting the heel turn to happen last night. That yeah. didn't happen. And uh, for those of you that tuned into our regular show on Saturday, so uh, when we recorded on Friday, it dropped yesterday, and my episode that I did with uh, Nick Towles, um, he suggested that um, he's, he's possibly expecting Omega and the Young Bucks to turn on Adam Page yeah. and kind of, uh, you know, have that bit of a swerve there to what we've all been thinking or what we've all been uh, traditionally kind of brainwashed to believe with, uh, with these sort of storylines that the opposite could happen. So, you know, that again is enough to get me tuned in week after week week to dynamite to see how it transpires and what happens and uh you know he's got me hooked it really has got me hooked genuinely excited for for kind of how it's going to play out because you've got that kind of dynamic there you've got that um air of intrigue as to what's going to happen next and uh, that's exactly what you want from uh, a wrestling angle and uh, the fact they didn't kind of blow it off last night was really good it kind of yeah. draws it out for a bit longer uh, which means that they they obviously know what they've got and uh, you know they, they want to kind of keep not not dragging it out unnecessarily but kind of you know they've obviously got more to tell in this story and i can't wait to see how it develops but um Really, really good stuff. Uh, but like you say, they possibly could well have peaked at this point. Uh, the next match was the uh, the Women's Championship match between Nyla Rose and Chris Statlander. Another match I was looking forward to going into it. Uh, now, uh, after the last match, the tag team title match, the, the crowd seemed a lot more tired. They obviously mm. had the, the wind taken out of their sails, um, as you would expect. But uh, this was an OK match. There were one or two you know, fairly clunky or clumsy moments in this match. Uh, however, despite a, a really spirited fight from uh, Chris Statlander, it was Nyla Rose who came out with a victory after an avalanche power bomb for the one, two, three. Um, and I think these two pulled out a good match, especially having to follow, you know, what, what uh, the match that was before them. Uh, my main question to you though, Chris, mm. is where do they go next with Chris Statlander? Uh, you know, after having two consecutive championship matches, she lost to uh, Ryu, I think one of the first shows of 2020. Um, and then of course this one here to Nyla Rose. It's clear that she's, dare I say, possibly the most popular um, woman on the, the, the AW women's roster at the moment. But, uh, you know, she was beaten fairly convincingly in the end here by Nyla Rose. Um, and, uh, you know, the second part of that question is, is there anybody on the AW women's division at the moment that can be a major threat to Nyla's championship reign um, anytime soon? Uh, so give us your thoughts on, on uh, Chris Statlander and, uh, you know, whether she might eventually be the, the one that takes the belt off of uh, Nyla Rose or somebody else. Mm, yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's always interesting. It's, they have to kind of um, have the right opponent, I suppose, really, because Statlander wouldn't have felt right maybe beating Riho. But I also thought Nyla Rose uh, would have been a transitional champion. I could see her losing this, uh, despite it being a first defence. So I think that's the problem, really, because they've had to transition uh, to a kind of heel champion. But then, yeah, you almost can't have her being how she is, so strong, so powerful, losing it so quickly, I think. So it was an interesting situation they put themselves in. Statlander is very good. I don't personally buy into this 
gimmick, but I can appreciate the talent. But I would say that um, one of my little girls, Amelia, was watching this match this morning and she caught her eye, you know, and I said, what do you like about her? And she went, oh, she's so cool. You know, dressed in purple and she can hang upside down. I said, well, maybe, yeah. maybe that's it. You know, maybe I'm not seeing that, you know. Yeah. Um, so I can see how she might appeal to kind of perhaps a you know younger generation of women, maybe. But where do they go? It's a really good question. Um, since turning Baker heel, Britt Baker, they've left her out of the equation. So I could see that maybe Statlander Baker, they've had it already, but I could see that would be a, a possible long-term rivalry. Um, it's an interesting one, really. It genuinely is. They've got. It's nobody talent. jumps out, is there? Really, it's nobody no. jumps out. No, no, no. Uh, you know, besides Chris Statlander, there's no other big baby face that really jumps out as possibly being a challenger for the title in the future. And you've obviously got, you know, the very the, the Joshi wrestlers that uh, yeah. crop up from time to time, but none of them really seem to be very credible or, you know. <sighs> It's a tough one. It really is a tough one. I mean, yeah. Big Swole, Big Swole's been getting a fair bit yeah. of air time and uh, that seems to be a, a character they're pushing at the moment. I think so. I think, you know, I like Big Swole personally and I think she could do that and it would be a good fit. Um, I think, you know, the Statlander lost clean ultimately and, yes. you know, it was a good finish. It was a good kind of power ball off the turnbuckle. But yeah, that's always the problem, isn't it? As soon as you lose finish, I'm sorry, lose clean as a face on your first try like that, it yeah. doesn't really give you very far to go. So um, I think they, Statlander is you know, good for the for AEW. And I think, yeah, she is something, I suppose, different, even if I don't personally like it. And um, I think there is definitely room for her as champion. Um, but yeah, against who? Uh, that is a really good question. And one we'll wait to see. But the talent <laughs> is there. They just need to develop it a little more. Um, and then we'll see, I guess. But yeah, mm. I don't have actually a straight answer for you that one. No, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, like I say, that, that will obviously keep our interest going yeah. to see who does eventually challenge. And, uh, you know, we, we could be getting some answers fairly soon. But uh, then an, another kind of headline match. You could say this, this could be billed as the co-main event, certainly mm-hmm. with the way they were building it up over recent uh, weeks in the last uh, few months. But MJF in this, in this big blood feud um, mm-hmm. versus Cody. So the, the build to this match has been epic from, from the cage match a couple of weeks ago. Um, against Wardlow through to the 10 lashes that Cody uh, had to endure. Um, also that he could get his hands uh, on, you know, on, on the person that he once called his friend, MJF, of course. Uh, the, the build to this match, I mean, the build to most of Cody's matches are fantastic, but the build mm-hmm. to this match in particular, when you look into the, you know, the stipulations and the hurdles that Cody had to overcome before he could even step into the, the into the ring with MJF last night was, was tremendous television. It really was absolutely tremendous television. Um, but uh, you know, going into the match, I mean, there, there was there was beer flying all over the place in the early stages. Here you had uh, NJF throwing a beer over a fan. I thought that was quite mm-hmm. amusing. I'm just waiting for a fan to kind of pop in one because he keeps <laughs> knocking people's hats off, throwing people's hats and uh, ripping people's signs up, and now throwing beers in their faces. But and then Brandy uh, threw a, a beer over Wardlow. Um, According to the commentary team, Cody suffered a broken toe from that moonsault off the cage a couple of weeks ago, yeah. which I didn't realise until last night. So that added an extra element into the match. Um, you know, then you had NJF uh, took advantage of this. He, he went after Cody's broken toe, even going as far as to removing Cody's right wrestling boot and biting Cody's broken toe. Um, so that was uh, quite gross and cringeworthy all at the same time. Uh, now, I... Uh, I'm not sure how it happens, but MJF somehow got thrown to the outside. And the next time he saw MJF, he was busted open and kind of mm. bleeding quite profusely. So that that wasn't maybe I took my eye off the ball or maybe that was the split second where I fell asleep during that match because of the, <laughs> uh, the, the time in the morning. Uh, then there, there was a, a mix up in communication on the outside with Cody going to kick Wardlow only to nail his own coach and mentor Arn Anderson. There's a suplex spot with Cody suplexing MJF over the top rope, but MJF holding on um, and mm-hmm. Cody goes over the top rope as well with both men landing quite hard on the outside. That was quite an interesting and a, 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 quite a, a special spot there. MJF um, does get a dose of his own medicine, however, when Cody uses his own weight belt to lash MJF. Uh, Cody then looks like he's about to get the win with two consecutive crossroads, uh, but with the referee's back turned, MJF goes into his trunks. He retrieves the, the, the diamond dozen ring that he won uh, a few weeks ago. He nailed Cody in the process with the, the loaded punch and got the pinfall. So uh, this was a, a, a really entertaining match. It, was, it, was, uh, uh, it wasn't a classic. Uh, some might say it was possibly overbooked. I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it didn't rely, you know, 
an awful lot on the gimmicks or the outside interferences. I, I think it definitely worked with what they produced at the end of the day. But um, I think it, with MJF winning, it definitely leads us to believe that the, the feud isn't over and uh, we're going to be getting uh, at least one more Cody and MJF uh, match somewhere down the line. Now, the next pay-per-view isn't until May, uh, Double or Nothing 2. So I, I, I don't know possibly they could keep it running until then i don't know mm. or maybe you know they could be involved in a, in a big kind of blow-off match in a future episode of, of dynamite but give us your thoughts on what went down during this match and kind of you know where it leads us in the aftermath to this match between these two sure quite a few thoughts on this one um so you mentioned about how mjf has yet to be popped by a fan you know in anger but he did tell a story about how he had a cup of warm piss through over him uh, down in mexico thinking it was a cup of beer uh, that had been thrown over him so not a fan of that i'm sure but what i am a fan of is mjf i love that man he is so good at being the old school traditional heel and you'll notice actually how little we've seen him uh, in the ring um you know so it's it's testament to him that his mic skills are that good and they've kept him in his high profile feuds but you really don't see him actually compete a lot i certainly haven't so for me i was actually really looking forward to a long mjf match you know where he could show his skills and they backed it up uh, on commentary you know jr was kind of surprised almost and was pleased with mjf's um you know output in terms of actual wrestling and i agree um i didn't doubt him but yeah it was good to see a, a longer kind of match from him um yeah. He's, um, you know, you talked about the, um, I just want to cover the kind of blade job almost there. Yeah, he got thrown to the outside. And next thing you know, after quite a long distraction, um, he comes back covered in blood. And I don't really know if that worked because one, it seemed really obvious that nothing could really happen to him, you know, to cause that. And, and two, yeah, it looks just like he was buying so much time to quickly kind of get a blade job in there. So, you know, I like seeing a bit of blood in those kind of matches. It really helps. But it would have been better, yeah, if there would have been something to say, oh, my God, he split him open, you know, in the, in the exact second we'd seen that because yeah. he didn't really seem to have anything there behind that. Uh, but what a build, uh, like you said, you know, the moonsault off the cage, broken toe, 100% legit, I can believe that. Um, and, yeah, the lashes, everything. It was really old school, really classic build, which I liked. Great entrances from both. Good to see a live band play Cody Allen. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I thought yeah. that was quite refreshing. I, I, I did kind of have to li- listen twice when it first started playing because I thought oh what, what's wrong with the audio here it didn't quite sound right to start off with then I realized it was a live band I thought ah right okay that makes sense yeah. and, uh, it really worked so I know Cody was you know a big fan of Downstate like obviously they they wrote the song as you'd know um Kingdom and um he'd been pitching for that for some time um but yeah so it, it did help not the greatest quality uh, on the audio as you say but live band being what it is uh Stephen Amell there I think made an appearance as part yeah. of the Nightmare family um quite a few guys there um I just, I like Cody, I really do, but his matches, and I've said this before on this very show, John, is that they are overbooked in my mind. And for someone who, yeah, is kind of now critical of WWE, they're they're very reminiscent of Triple H matches. I feel like him and Triple H have the same kind of match now. You know, it's all about the blood feud and... Yeah, yeah it's typically there's, you know, there's lots of carnage and weapons involved and outside interference sometimes. So, um, again, I think it's too much. If you are a face, I don't think you need, like, your coach there and your wife there and your team. It just makes you look poor. But I especially don't think Cody, as much as I love Arn Anderson, I don't think he needs him. I think he's yeah. a veteran in himself. You know, it, it makes him look, I think, a bit foolish to have this this man with his clipboard saying, this is what you need to do. It doesn't really make him look any better in my mind. I have no problem with Brandy being there. She's always been, I think, quite an asset and she certainly got involved, as you know. But yeah, I, I think maybe it's too much to have them both there. Um, so yeah, no more than one person. That's my rule I've written down, <laughs> unless, unless you're yeah. able, you know. I, I think that's a great point, um, but uh, a really good point about Arn Anderson. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Brandy can come out for every match, whether code is involved or not. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, but uh, that's uh, another story for another podcast. But uh, let's move on to uh, another match that I was really looking forward to. And uh, I think one match that the internet wrestling community was genuinely excited about, and that was uh, purely because of the, who was involved in the dynamics and this uh, one person in particular really getting over uh, with the, the AEW fans. But it's, of course, Pac versus Orange Cassidy. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> This match, uh, they've had a little bit of a feud on Dynamite over the last few weeks, which is built to this match here. But you kind of look at this on paper and you think, wow, you know, two completely contrasting stars, two completely, you know, different uh, contrasting wrestlers. But it it, it worked. It really worked. And, uh, you know, uh, 
Pack kind of gets it, doesn't he? He just completely, uh, he just gets it. And uh, you know, there was a, a bit of a an exchange of kicks between these two. Uh, Pack soon took control of the match, um, sending Cassidy into the barriers on the outside. This is when the match started to get more serious, and when Pack. Um, was uh, fed up of all the fun and games. Um, and then they sent uh, Cassidy headfirst into the ring post before proceeding to destroy Cassidy inside the ring, getting a two count from a Liger bomb. Cassidy recovers to strike a, a tope. So we're familiar with uh, Cassidy hitting the tope, usually with his hands in his pockets. Uh, but then he follows it up with a flying crossbody from the top and a DDT. And uh, that, that was probably more action, more moves that we've seen from Orange Cassidy uh, than in his entire time in AEW. Cassidy was it was definitely he was trying he was definitely trying in this match uh Cassidy hits an avalanche DDT and a diving DDT before getting a close near fall from an air raid crash then the Lucha Brothers come out uh, and they come out to attack the best friends now obviously Trent Beretta and Chucky D they they, they were part of the best friends uh group and uh, Orange Cassidy is kind of their uh, adopted brother uh, within that group and uh, he accomp- they accompanied Orange down to the ring where they were kind of chased off and fought to the back with the Lucha Brothers um um, and as Cassidy looked on, Pack comes from behind and uh, I think he possibly hits a, a low blow first, but then he hooks in the, the brutalizer uh, with the referee calling for an end to the match, giving the submission win to Pack. So th- fairly reminiscent of how the opening match went down, to be honest with you, between Hager and uh, Dustin Runnels. Uh, with the uh, with the, 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 the submission win. Um, but uh, this was really a, a lot of fun i'm not gonna say it's a great match but it's a really fun match and uh, uh pack was his usual bastard self orange cassidy uh was the real star in this one with, with the fans into everything that he did and 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 pad and, and pack um you know what they did together as, as a as unit in this match and uh, it was a really fun entertaining match so i think similar to what we were talking earlier about darby allen AEW, you know, they, they really have something special in Orange Cassidy here. Not, not everybody is a big fan of Orange Cassidy. He's like Marmite, to be honest with you. But they have protected the Orange Cassidy character quite perfectly, preventing him from, you know, being overexposed or having a singles match up until last night, of course. And I felt that the, the pack was the perfect opponent for Cassidy. Like I said earlier, he just gets it. Um, yet another, you know, homegrown star, as in Orange Cassidy, uh, that uh, AEW have, have handled perfectly uh, by a company that appeared to know how to build new stars stars so uh, over to you chris uh, orange cassidy versus pack it was a really fun match and uh yeah uh, give us your thoughts on how this went down and uh, your thoughts on the individuals involved yeah so um both are fantastic in their own ways you know pack um it's good to see pack maybe take it easy you know he's had some very intense matches so it was nice of him to probably have something that you consider a bit of a walk in the park especially after the iron man match so big fan of both Difficult not to to love Orange Cassidy, to be honest. I think you're right. They know exactly what they've got, and they've held him back brilliantly till that brilliant moment in the match where he's decided he's had enough. He smiles and he, he just, you know, he goes nuts. So it's really well executed. Um, I, I remember saying this a few months back that he makes me laugh, and you know, as a bit of kind of older man now, it's it's quite hard to do that. So I was really like, you know, smiling throughout, to be honest great fun match perfect foils for each other very polarizing i particularly like the nickname king of sloth style obviously. <laughs> that's really quite amusing um and um the right person one of course you know my mind pack had to win uh but he did it in a very brutal fashion and you know not to play on the pun of the brutalizer but it's a great finish and i love that finishing move it really just looks painful it leaves them he was almost knocked out which i thought was a good little touch um but yeah and i, I also wanted to mention orange cassidy entrance video now i'm not sure if you saw it when he's coming down to the ramp his kind of titan tron video it's simply just his name on a white background and like black you know writing a very lazy signature at one point uh, <laughs> so it's just everything that's what i mean they've got it they've absolutely got it everything about him they understand so i love the fact that even his entrance video is lazy uh, and can't be bothered so that's a nice touch brilliant fun exactly the kind of match you want to put in between the two matches you know the preceding the one we're going to see after um and yeah so Part of how you put on a great pay-per-view is exactly where you place these matches, and this one was perfectly placed. Of course, that could be a death spot sometimes, but I think they knew it was so different, it would keep the crowd going, uh, and it did. Um, so, yeah, really, really great to see um, Orange Cassidy kind of utilise a little more. Um, again, you've just got to be careful not to overdo it with him. You yes. know, he works really well when he's a kind of mascot for the best friends, and it's lovely to see him do something. But, yeah, you don't want to see that every week, you know, and ruin the, the magic trick, as it were. 
Exactly, exactly. And uh, Orange Cassidy is so different, so unique mm. uh, that so I'm genuinely excited to see what they do. And this, this you know, this is uh, where I have to hold up my hands and say, you know, I have become much more of an AEW convert over the last year or so. Um, and, and Orange Cassidy was one of those I kind of looked at and thought, well, this ain't professional wrestling. Well, what's, what's this guy all about? You know, what? Why? Why? Why are they paying him money to, to do this? Mm-hmm. I could do that, but then you kind of you get it. And the fact that they've drawn it out and they've, yeah. you know, let the fans buy into his character and they allowed him to have his first match last night at Revolution after however many months he's been with the company, kind of being the mascot to best friends and mm-hmm. getting involved you know here and there um but um i think the way they've handled him and his character has been absolutely perfectly and um yeah i'm genuinely excited and i've said that a few times already during this podcast to what they do for this character and uh, where they can go with orange cassidy um orange cassidy aw world champion sometime in the future anybody <laughs> we, we we will see we will see but um i'm sure i'm sure he's got uh big uh, things ahead of him because he's got that fan support much in the same way uh with, with darby allen as well but uh, let's have a look at our main event then chris mm. for the aw world heavyweight championship uh le champion chris jericho going up against uh, john moxley <coughs> the entrances were fantastic there was a yeah. really big fight feel to this match a really big fight feel to this match uh the match starts uh, in amongst the fans uh that they, they they fight through the crowd they fight up onto the entrance ramp then moxley uh bites jericho's stitches across his eye um, which I thought was quite gross but uh, quite effective at the same time uh, Jericho reacts by throwing Mox into the edge of the ring post and their ring posts in, in AW are not entirely square with sharp edges but they are kind of square with rounded edges and uh, that appeared to cut Moxley open a uh, hard way um, he was bleeding from the forehead uh, Jericho power bombed Moxley onto the timekeeper's table, landing on top of the, the ring bell in the process. After a brief comeback from Moxley, Jericho gets a two count from a lion salt. Uh, Jake Hager comes down um, following his, his kind of match in the opening match of the night from earlier on. He comes down to interfere, allowing Jericho to connect with a, a code breaker uh, following that interference. Hager gets involved again, this time causing the referee to eject uh, Santana and Ortiz, who accompany Jericho down to the ring, and Jake Hager to the back. Uh, Sammy Guevara comes from out of nowhere to nail Moxley with, with the championship bout to a bout shot to the head before uh, making it uh, making his quick exit through the crowd. Uh, the end of the match comes where Moxley pulls off his eye patch to reveal that he can see out of his previously injured eye before dropping Jericho with a, a paradigm shift hook in the leg getting the one two three so we have a brand new AEW world heavyweight champion uh, the fans are up on their feet to congratulate uh, the win and the title change and uh, uh, after fighting off the entire inner circle uh, Moxley was able to uh, to win the numbers game you could say uh, to win the championship and uh, after the match Moxley gave an in-ring promo as the new AEW world champion so uh, a lot to unpick here um, it, it, it wasn't you know, by any stretch of imagination, the best match on the card. Um, it had outside interference as well, so it was a fair bit of booking in there as well. Um, I think, from my perspective, I, I I understand why they've given the bout to uh, to Moxley, and I think he'll make a tremendous AEW World Champion. I I personally uh, felt that they they should have kept the championship on Jericho a bit longer. I felt that uh, it, you know Jericho being the champion with the inner circle. Um, and everything that comes with it was really, really working. Maybe, you know, that they, they, they did realise that there's more mileage in it and they could end up with a second championship reign for uh, for Jericho somewhere down the line. So uh, I'm not, not overly disappointed that Moxley became champion because, like I said, I think that uh, you've got two very similar superstar wrestlers you know, in Moxley and Jericho, of course. So uh, regardless of who's holding the belt, it won't be too much different in terms of what they can bring uh, to that reign or to the company as champion. Um, but uh, I mean, my question too is, you know, give, give us your thoughts on the match. And do you think they took the belt off Jericho too soon? Yeah, good match. As you said, you know, it's difficult at this point, especially after kind of Cody MJF to have an, a bells and whistles match. And yeah. this is often the way, isn't it? Like you've kind of, you've had the highs and lows already. You've had the interference. You've had the kind of all the stuff on the outside sometimes. So yeah, it can be difficult to recreate that. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, quite a solid match. Not maybe the epic, epic match I wanted it to be. And um, even though it was quite long, it wasn't, you know, again, not as long as it perhaps could have been for me. Um, but 
going through, yeah, Hager, Sammy, Santana, Ortiz, all the inner circle interference, I guess that was kind of predictable. So it was nice once they got past all that and could get into the final kind of five minutes or so. So just like the finish of the MJF Cody match, which did like, I didn't see it coming. It was well done with the, the diamond ring, you know, slipped to him. And this is the same with the eye patch. So yeah, I actually thought that was quite ingenious. Makes me question whether or not it was worth wrestling all that time, you know, with an eye patch. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, whether the ends justifies the means, but it was a good little twist and, um, not for the first time he's outsmarted Jericho and I like that as the the face kind of uh, you know challenger that you can actually beat the odds through a bit of intelligence as well so it did that um Jericho's been a tremendous champion and I know uh maybe on the first time we ever chatted John about AEW I wasn't particularly pleased with the choice and I thought maybe it should be Hangman Page as the shining future um but looking back it was the right move and you know he's obviously a well-known name throughout the world and he's done a tremendous job. This has been vintage kind of Jericho, maybe even like peak Jericho. This, um, where Agreed. he goes, from, yeah, yeah. Sorry, when 100%. he goes from here is it's, it's arguable because it'd be interesting to see if the inner circle sticks by him now, you know, without the championship, which could then lead, yeah, to the inevitable kind of breakdown and uh, someone challenging from there. But for now. I think Moxley is the right choice um, because he's arguably the most popular act on the card. Um, he's pretty well known, you know, and it was, it was very hot when he came into this. Um, and if they're going to use the kind of uh, wins and loss records to, you know, state who should be the best, well, then he's got a particularly good, you know, win loss record. So at least they've been consistent there. Um, but yeah, really not a tremendous match, but I didn't really mind because I think the right choice was made at the end. He's taken the belt off him now. Good promo afterwards as well. Really heartfelt. Beer o'clock, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. I was like, yeah, it felt like that kind of celebration. Um, so I think for them, it's, it's going to be good now to see him as champ and take on all come as a fighting champion. Jericho can now hopefully take it easy a little because I think he's probably do a break. You know, he's done some tremendous work. Um, probably inevitable rematch between those two, and then we'll move on. Um, lots of exciting challenges for Moxley. Um, we've kind of had the Omega thing, but yeah, potentially it leads to all kinds of different interests and angles there. So not a amazing match, a very solid, uh, but the finish and the decision, I think, uh, was enough to, to keep me happy. But as you might know, I'm a big fan of Mox anyway. So, yeah, I think I was always going to be happy as long as he won and took home yeah. the title. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing maybe as soon as this Wednesday a pissed mm. off Jericho, a, yeah. a Jericho that's kind of angry, throwing things around, possibly emotional, and uh, the, the kind of dynamic and the relationship uh, that that kind of uh, has with with the rest of the inner circle uh, crowd. There, I think they're calling themselves the, the Paymaker Posse now. But uh, <laughs> we're really looking forward to seeing the kind of the, the reaction, the aftermath, especially with regards to Chris Jericho and how he's going to cope without uh, having the World Championship mm. there. Um, but uh, really, really interested. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Mox is going to be a really good champion. Uh, I, 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 like yourself, I can see a rematch happening somewhere down the line. I think that's almost a kind of a, a natural kind of uh, follow through, really follow on to what happened last night. Um, but yeah, a really, really good. A, a nice heartfelt promo, as you said, from Moxley to kind of finish off the show. Um, but I mean, looking at Revolution as, as a package, I mean, I thought it was a tremendous show. Um, and um, I think if I were to compare it to their other pay-per-views, I'd say maybe Double or Nothing, number one. And this one would probably just go underneath it as maybe the second best pay-per-view they've done in their short kind of tenure as a company so far. Um, but uh, yeah, there wasn't a bad match uh, on the card. Um, like I say, I'm sure there's going to be fans out there are going to be fairly critical of the women's match. Um, but um, yeah, I thought it was very, very good. I mean, match of the night for me. Uh, I am slightly torn between the Sammy Guevara and Diab Darby Allen match um, mm -hmm. as compared to the, the, the World Tag Team title match. But um, I'll, I'll probably go for the Tag Team title match because that match, um, and a lot of people are going to kind of hate me for this, but that match was the match that kind of converted me to the Young Bucks, to be honest with you. I was very critical of them in the past and I have been uh, very critical in the past on this podcast. Uh, but that was the match that kind of really sold them to me last night. So uh, for that and for the ongoing storyline between Page and Omega and the Bucks. I felt really, really worked. So that's my number one match of the night. Um, but, you know, I, I found that the show really, what it succeeded in most was really presenting to us and, and kind of giving us you know, a glimpse of the future, to be honest with you. When you look at Adam Page, when you look at Darby Allen, when you look at Sammy Guevara, Orange Cassidy, you know, that's the, the future of the company. And I think that 
they all came out, whether they were on the winning or the losing end to their matches, they came out looking so much stronger um, at the end of this pay-per-view than when they, you know, Gareth Aitland, than when they went in because of the exposure and the quality of match and how they've been able to kind of get their character over even more just in the space of their match last night. But I absolutely loved um, everything that was presented to me last night. And um, another person I've got to give a, a bit of a shout out to, and I know we mentioned him earlier, but it's Kevin, Kevin, Kenny Omega. Um, I thought he's had a tremendous week, certainly that 30 minute Ironman match against Pac delivered in spades. Um, his uh, kind of outing last night, uh, with, with himself and Paige managing, managing to retain the championship. So I thought that uh, Kenny Omega is playing his part really, really well in that uh, tandem um, and in that whole storyline. But um, otherwise, a really good show. Uh, we, we only got one championship uh, change, and that was uh, in Moxley beating Jericho in the main event. But uh, give us your kind of your overall thoughts and your kind of takeaways from uh, AEW Revolution from last night then, Chris. Yeah, it was um, really well paced. Um, like you said, there was no real fat. Uh, on on the the card, and there was no uh, no bad matches, and I think even the women's match possibly just suffered by its placement, and someone had to be in that spot, unfortunately, following that very strong tag match. You had yeah. about five different heel finishes, I think, as well, which is always good because it keeps the storylines going. But some of the finishes were genuinely shocking. I didn't expect MJF to win. I, I really didn't. Um, you know, and the way it was set up towards the end i didn't think he would so i like that you know i like uh, like i said the the placement of the matches i think they've got it very well i think the only kind of criticism is although the show is long it's almost like you you need a bit more time between some of these matches and it's something that maybe wwe would do quite well maybe with adverts for stuff or backstage stuff you know or maybe some interviews yeah. I'd be critical of AEW. I've, I've said this before. I, perhaps it's a bit too kind of ring centric and I could do with, you know, a few more kind of uh, backstage stuff. They have the promos, you know, before each match, which are great. But yeah, sometimes it just feels like one action packed match onto the other. But yeah, really good. Probably, as you say, probably maybe the tied best or maybe second place, the best pay-per-view they've done so far. Um but really consistent. And if I want to introduce someone, you know, to the product, I would definitely show them maybe three out of those uh, six or so, seven or so matches uh, on the card. Um, but yeah, really like use the time. Well, I'm really pleased with it, to be honest. And um, a proud, I think is the the feeling, you know, overall, as you know, big fan from day one. Yeah, so yeah. to see them get to that point where they're consistently putting on the quality so early on really uh, and the production is now coming up as well to match it you know the entrance videos were were great you know the atmosphere was great uh, the crowds will grow the stadiums will grow the live performances will be featured again you know there'll be more special guests and I think that's coming now and that's for me the only thing that's been missing it's just catching up uh, to the quality of its uh, kind of bigger well-known competitor um, but yeah I, I can't actually fault the cards you know which when I look back on a lot of pay-per-views that me and, and you would have watched over the years, you you were lucky to maybe get three, you know, out of seven maybe matches. You go, oh, that was good. You know, oh, that was great. So to say that they were all good to great uh, yes. really is very indicative of how good AEW is at the moment. So, yeah, the future's bright. There's plenty of young kids there that are going to do the business and young ladies as well, of course. Um, but, yeah, they're really, um, really pleased with it. And, and, yeah, proud, proud of those guys, all of them genuinely. I think they've they've done the business. There we go. And speaking of doing the business, I think we've done the business, Chris. So uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being a special guest on this AW Revolution pay-per-view review. It's been great to have you back on board. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime in the future. I know that their next pay-per-view is just around the corner in May with Double and I think, too. So we'd love to get you back mm -hmm. on. And maybe we can uh, convince uh, Ash to start watching uh, AW again and uh, <laughs> jump on board to cash in that, uh, that podcast uh, briefcase that he's carrying around threatening to, to use on us. But uh, <laughs> yeah, gr great to have you back on board buddy and uh, thank you i hope you enjoyed uh, covering the show with me this week yeah it was a blast john thanks for having me back on of course uh, yeah always always good to chat with you about AEW, and i'm glad to hear you're a bit more convert now i feel like I've yes done my job <laughs> definitely um, so really good and uh, yeah pleasure as always Excellent. Good man. But uh, thanks to Chris and uh, thanks to everybody for listening to this AW Revolution review. Uh, please keep it tuned to the rest of the podcast for all of your weekly NXT and AW weekly reviews, of course, regular WWE and AW pay-per-view reviews such as this one here. Uh, exclusive interviews like the one that I've done recently with Chantal Jordan or Big F and Joe uh, and so much more. And if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, please don't forget to spread the word. Tell your friends and tell your family and don't forget to subscribe to the rest of the podcast if you don't miss out on a single episode so for one final time uh, for, from myself and from Chris thank you very much for listening and we'll catch up with you all again soon